and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Dark Brandon's in serious trouble. Not only is he reaching new depths of senility, not just losing his way when leaving the stage, but walking straight into the staging wall itself. But not only that, his deputy Kamala Harris is reaching new heights of laughing gas insanity. I swear she's drinking, taking drugs, or laughing gas, or all of the above. One thing is for sure, the world ain't safe in the hands of old Joe and young Kamala. President Erdogan, on the other hand, looks to be headed for a first round victory, confounding the United States regime change plan for Turkey. Another setback for the Yankees in the East. And speaking of which, Rishi Sunak is in trouble too. Letters are going in to the 1922 committee. <laughs> 52 have already been received. The Tories have had three leaders in the last 12 months. They might be about to get a fourth or will they be going back to Boris Johnson? There's much, much more coming up. The Indians, speaking of Rishi Sunak, want their jewellery back. You know, the billions of dollars worth of jewellery that the British have stolen, one of them in the front of King Charles's crown, even redesigned and trendified as it was in the uh, coronation last week. And Africa, going from strength to strength in many ways, is also attracting the bully boys in Washington. It's all coming up. It is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. There are some things in life that I don't get. Not many, because whether I agree with them or not, I kind of understand where most people are coming from, why they say and do the things that they do. But here's one I simply don't. And despite asking for logical explanations, I have received none. How come Israel was allowed to perform in the Eurovision Song Contest last night and Russia was not? Now, I'm not talking about uh, longitude and latitude. I'm not talking about points on the compass of the European Broadcasting Union's satellite. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about politics. How come Russia was banned from Eurovision, but Israel not just honored, but again winning a respectable place in the medal table? Can it be because Russia has invaded its neighbor's territory? Can it be because Russia has effectively annexed a part of its neighbor's territory? Can it be because Russia is making war on some of the people in its native next door territory? Can it be because Russia is breaking international law in so doing all of the above? Can it be because Russia is repressing human rights in the territory it now controls? Can it be any of these things? And of course, it cannot. Israel spent the entire week prior to the Eurovision Song Contest bombarding to smithereens an absolutely captive, illegally captive population of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. More than two million Palestinians live there. Israel controls every exit and every entrance. Most of the time, the people have no clean water and no electricity. 
a real problem in the winter, an even bigger problem in the summer, especially if you're trying to keep medicines usable in the midst of regular repeated carnage. Israel spent last week systematically destroying people's houses. Of course, an Israeli bomb has zero impact on international public opinion, zero impact on the people who organized the Eurovision Song Contest. But of course, a Russian bomb is far more effective. Well, one or two of them have been particularly effective this very week. But returning to my point, Israel has illegally occupied the entire West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip for the last 65 years. 65 years of international law-breaking. More than that, they have now illegally annexed the Golan Heights that belong to Syria and East Jerusalem that they conquered by military means. They have broken every international law by creating hundreds of thousands of settlers in settlements with separate settler roads, with an apartheid system where the Palestinians queue through the barbed wire to go from A to B while the settlers travel on a super highway built with your taxes. Israel has, by any standards, conducted an illegal apartheid system in the occupied territories for 65 years. Don't believe me. Believe brave Israeli journalists and broadcasters who've been making this very point this week. But not content with 65 years of law breaking, every so often, and last week was another, they go on a murderous rampage, killing women and children in their beds, in their houses, bombing an apartment building to kill three of their political opponents, caring not that dozens, scores of other people were asleep in that very same apartment building. This is what I would call terrorism, wouldn't you? Even if you don't call it terrorism, it is a war crime. That simply cannot be gainsaid. It is a war crime to target civilian residential dwellings. It is a war crime to deny electricity and water to territories that you control. It is a war crime to change the character of territory you have seized by military means and occupy. It is a war crime to annex and declare to be yours territory that belongs to another. None of these things are even contestable. But Israel is in the Eurovision Song Contest. It's in the European Football Championships. Even though it isn't even in Europe. Russia is in Europe. Now, whatever view you take, Russia has undoubtedly invaded Ukraine. Russia has undoubtedly, through referenda, separated some of the territory that it has liberated from its former owner, the state of Ukraine, and now it's in Russia. And that's why Russia's been banned. I actually don't have a problem with that. That is completely inevitable, completely predictable. It's what you would expect to happen. My point is, why does it happen to Russia, but doesn't happen to Israel? There's one other difference. Russia is on the receiving end of withering international criticism, ostracism in the mainstream media. There is no insult considered too base 
to be thrown at Russia. But Israel isn't sanctioned or criticized at all. In fact, it's becoming a crime to criticize it in Western countries. Israel is receiving endless reward from the so-called international community for the crimes that it is committing. I'm just asking why the double standard, though double standard doesn't quite deal with hypocrisy on that level. Now on to some other matters. The Pope had an audience with President Zelensky this week. At least that's what it looked like in the photographs. Zelensky was sat down while His Holiness the Pope was stood up. Zelensky was shaking hands with the chief of staff of the pontiff whilst remaining in his seat. Something you wouldn't do to a bum that approached you in the street. But that's how they treated the Pope. And I got to wondering what happened to the Pope. The Pope was very clear early in this conflict that NATO shared the blame for what has happened in Ukraine. Where did that go, Father Francis? Where did the peace plan of the Vatican go, Father Francis? Would you go to Moscow and stand up whilst Putin was sitting down? Would you bless the armed forces of Russia as you blessed the armed forces of Ukraine. Why do people who say they want to broker peace actually blow it out of the water by demonstrating vividly their preconceptions, their own personal and political dispositions? But more important than how Zelensky treated the Pope, it's how he's treating you that's worrying me. The economic, cultural, political position in Europe, American-occupied Europe, it must now again be described, is such that one begins to question the sanity, not of the European political leaders. They will be richly rewarded for the stances that they are taking. But the sanity of you, the European public, who are watching silently, except in the case of France, and except in the case of thousands, not millions, of demonstrators against the war, against NATO, against the US, in various European cities, capitals, and otherwise. You are, for the most part, silently climbing on board a truck which you know or ought to know is taking you to the national political abattoir. We are spending billions defending the borders of Ukraine, but we cannot defend our own borders from thousands upon thousands, in the American case, hundreds of thousands, of illegal, overwhelmingly men, Migrants who are arriving on our shores, undocumented, uncharted, unchecked, many of them disappearing to God knows where. Did you see the American border? Why is Joe Biden sending hundreds of billions of dollars to defend the border of Ukraine when his own border has literally fallen? It's literally fallen down and the masses of the oppressed of Latin America, oppressed by decades of US-sponsored dictatorship, the poor from Latin America, impoverished by decades of American economic and political dominance, are headed to a hotel near you. In Washington, they're turfing US military veterans out of hotels 
and putting the new influx of Latin American migrants in it. Is there any wonder that trouble is brewing in the US and in Europe over all of this? Over the fact that we're endlessly a war abroad but can't even defend ourselves at home? And so I'm wondering, not just about Kamala Harris, did you see the video of her talking? about how her mother used to ask her if she thought she fell out of a coconut tree. Giggle, silence from the audience. I'm worried about the sanity of all and sundry in this political picture that we find ourselves in. India is on the warpath and I'm right behind them. India wants its jewelry back. The British Empire stole trillions of dollars from India. And most of it is simply unrepayable. But the jewellery isn't. And India wants every last artifact and piece of precious jewellery that the British stole from them back. The most significant of which is the Kohinoor diamond which sits, last time I looked, right on the front of King Charles III's regal, th regal uh, crown. Now, I'm ready, the Indians would like me to, to try and stage a citizen's arrest of His Majesty to return that stolen property to its rightful owner. Although it may be that the courts will get there before me. President Erdogan's downfall was eagerly anticipated and industriously worked for by the United States, by the NATO leadership whose troublesome priest they are, he is. They have long wanted someone, anyone, Bulen or any of the uh, donkey derby opponents facing him in today's election to beat him, to get him out of office. Now, I have many, many differences with President Erdogan, but I'll tell you this, when I look at the people who hate him most, when I look at the people who are trying to bring him down, I say, well done, President Erdogan, because it looks like you are going to secure a first round victory, despite all the regime change efforts that were made. In Africa, we had the most extraordinary spectre this week, where the American ambassador to South Africa publicly accused the leadership of South Africa of breaking international law, of being criminals, the country to which he's accredited. He publicly accused them of being criminals. He's walked it back saying he realizes he crossed a line, but he did it. And it's there in the ether now for always. And I got to reminiscing. I was reminiscing about the role that the United States and the United Kingdom and almost all of the countries of the European Union, but not the ones that were then under Russian influence, played in the maintenance of, and then in the destruction of the apartheid system in South Africa. I just saw a post which astounded me. In 1990, after the liberation, after the release of President Mandela, regarded globally as one of the greatest men ever to walk the earth, after his release and prior to his first ever visit to the United States of America, the US government, which had him on their list of banned terrorists until 2008, wouldn't send him an airplane capable of taking him from South Africa 
to the United States. According to the post that I have just looked at, who do you think flew President Mandela to the United States for his first visit there after his release from the apartheid dungeons in South Africa? Donald Trump! Donald Trump sent one of the Trump air fleet to fly Mandela from South Africa to the United States because the United States government would not do so. I'm old enough to remember when all of the countries of Western Europe, of North America, and the United Kingdom itself stood four square with apartheid and against Mandela and the ANC and the freedom struggle. Yes, compute that if you're too young to remember it. Do you know who was on the side of the liberation movement all of those decades? Do you know who gave them everything they needed to liberate themselves? Russia. That's why the West is backing the apartheid state in the Eurovision Song Contest and banning the country that always struggled against apartheid. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. It is the mother of all talk shows. The 1897 edition of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, read by George Galloway, available only on Patreon. The Cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens, said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash on Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. Listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. One point six million people watched all or part of the mother of all talk shows in the last seven days. Just get that finger in your ear. One point six million viewers of the mother of all talk shows in the last seven days. Compare and contrast with, I don't know, Rupert Murdoch's talk TV or Sky or any BBC current affairs politics program or any current affairs politics program anywhere else in the English speaking world. 1.6 million viewers over the last seven days. In fact, 963,000 of those were for last Wednesday's show, which will continue to grow until next Wednesday. These are phenomenal pieces of evidence that the public in the English-speaking world is desperate for an alternative point of view. Even if just to hear and see it and compare and contrast it, with the mainstream view which is being rammed down their throats 24-7 on every channel and on the front page of every newspaper. Is Israel guilty of war crimes in Gaza was the poll question that we asked 
and 20,000 people have already answered it, and the show has just begun. Is Israel guilty of war crimes? A, yes. B, no. You can vote on my Twitter feed, on YouTube, on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, or on the YouTube community poll where an astounding 17,000 people have already voted. The telephone numbers uh, through which you can reply to anything that I have said, if you disagree with me, your call will be prioritized. Women callers are prioritized. First-time callers are prioritized. Ergo, if you are all three of those, you're definitely getting on the show. The UK and Ireland number, and remember, it's free of charge, is 0808196552. That's 0808196552. If you're in the US or Canada, again, entirely free, toll-free, Plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And if you're in the possibly mythical rest of the world, it's plus four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. My next guest is one of the best intellectuals on the European European mainland with a great breadth of expertise as a commentator, journalist, and broadcaster. He is Elijah Magnier. He's a veteran war zone correspondent, uh, but he also does a fair bit of sharp political analysis too. And Elijah joins us now to discuss, amongst other things, Elijah, the Turkish election. The, the votes are not by any means all counted yet. But uh, President Erdogan has a very large lead over the main opposition candidate and may even avoid having to have a second round runoff. That's at least my take. What is yours? Hello, George. It's great to be with you. I do agree with you. However, only 70 percent of the votes have been counted so far. And he has indeed 51 percent, which he only needs 50% plus one to win the election from the first round. And I also agree with you that there are many differences with Erdogan's policy, particularly in Syria, in Azerbaijan, in accepting Finland as part of NATO, and all the other things with the refugee, etc., and the uh, uh, occupation of uh, still part of Syria and Iraq. However, there is a desperate uh, Western will to remove, to see Erdogan away and uh, see a change of power, even if the Turkish election is one of the most democratic elections that the Middle East can have, and even Europe, because we've seen 88% of the 63.5 million voters, which means 57 million voted, which is for the Turks is a kind of a ceremony to go and vote. And fortunately for the Kurds, for the locals, they don't really care or don't read, they don't have access to Western mainstream media because they don't want to and they don't read and they don't look for another language unless it's translated by the local media. So all this call about the lack of democracy in such uh, an excellent democratic election is only heard by uh, among the mainstream media journalists who are really talking to each other and nobody is listening to what they are saying when they say it is not democratic, when they're saying that Erdogan has been too long in power, where Angela Merkel stayed for 15 years in power, and they say it's a lack of democracy when our best allies have never seen an election like Saudi Arabia, like Egypt, like uh, all the Middle Eastern countries who know nothing about democracy, and yet they are our best allies. So all these accusations against Erdogan and pushing the Kurds for the first time who live in the southeast uh, of Turkey to vote for uh, Kemal Kirikdar Oglu, the uh, er- uh, Erdogan's opponent, this is unheard of in the history of Turkey. And yet, 
uh, more than 70-75% of the Kurds that represent more or less 10% of the voters supported the opposition. Still, Erdogan has, until this moment, 51%. And I think if he continue with, eight, if we reach 80% and if he maintains this distance, then he will make it in the first round and there is no need to go for a second round on the 18th of May. Splendid uh, overview uh, tour of the Turkish horizon there, Elijah. I'm grateful uh, for that. I want to focus on the Kurds. Uh, the Kurds are uh, picked up and put down again according to the needs of those who wish to use them. Their legitimate rights, long denied, not just in Turkey, uh, but in other places too. Uh, are sometimes dusted down, given front of house, and then, of course, put back on the shelf when the Western uh, politicians and media no longer need them. So uh, there, was the, there was the immortal phrase uh, of now Lord Archer, Geoffrey Archer, the former parliamentary colleague of mine, when he explained to Parliament, you see, there are good cards and there are bad cards. The good Kurds are the ones opposed to Saddam Hussein. The bad Kurds are the ones opposed to the then friendly Turkish uh, regime. So suddenly the Turkish Kurds, long ignored, have now been given uh, front of house prominence by Western commentators uh, who ignored them all down the decades. What impact? will that have on the non-Kurdish Turkish majority? Will this not deepen uh, the divisions between Kurdish citizens of Turkey and non-Kurdish citizens of Turkey? Well, the Kurds of Turkey have been known in the past years, uh, the past decades, have been majority Sunni with a small minority of Alevi. However, after the era of uh, Kemal Ataturk, uh, they became today more secular. This is why the Americans uh, put all their weight on the Kurds to support uh, the opponent of Erdogan because Kemal um, uh, Kelegdaroglu would never had uh, dared to run the election without the 10% of the voters, and th that represent the Kurds. Of course, there's going to be a difference between uh, the, the Kurds and the Turks, even if the Kurds live in Turkey, and they were given a status by Kemal Ataturk. However, the late prime minister of Turkey denied the Kurdish language. They called them the Kurds of the mountain, and this is why the... the uh, a uh, word that the uh, Kurds have only the mountains as friends comes from. Uh, nevertheless, they are integrated in the society. And the only problem today is they have indeed responded to the wish of the Americans. Because if we look at the uh, uh, coalition of the opposition against Erdogan, they have absolutely nothing in common the government would have been a disaster because they have all different program, nationalistic, right-wing, uh, Islamist, uh, all, all walks of life and different ideologies and different uh, political program. Uh, and yet they have managed to come together only on one common ground, is to remove Erdogan from power, which means how uh, deeply Erdogan was hurting the Americans, not because he was pro-Russian. And here we have to be careful. No Turkish president can be pro-Russian or pro-American. Every single Turkish president needs to keep a balance between, between the US and the West and Russia, which is something that the Americans don't want at all. They want to see someone who's supporting them. They want to see someone who's closing on uh, Russia completely, 
They have supported the coup d'etat in 2016. I remember when I received the communique from the U.S. embassy supporting this color revolution, a coup d'etat against Erdogan, when the few months later, uh, before he downed a Russian jet. So pushing the Kurds to play with the fate of the Kurds and then push them against Erdogan, that most probably he's going to win in this election, is not going to put the Kurds in a good position. However, the Americans don't care. Otherwise, they would have left the northeast Syria and allowed the reconciliation between the Kurds and the Syrian government. And every time there is a talk between the Kurds and Damascus, the Americans come forward and prevent that. So the consequences when the Americans will leave, and they will eventually leave because no occupation forces can remain in any country, when they leave, what's going to happen to the Kurds that they have supported all these years against their government, against the government that we received them? And this is why the problem that the Kurds haven't learned this, the lesson by watching what happened to the Kurds in Iraq, how the Americans abandoned them when they wanted to declare their independence and called for a referendum, and how the Kurds will be abandoned in Turkey and in Syria when the U.S. will end their uh, interest with the Kurds. The wheel is still in spin, of course, across the region. And uh, the U.S. are placing bets on uh, losing turns of that wheel over and over again. They uh, are now at loggerheads with Egypt, which they have long uh, paid for, long uh, armed and given military support uh, to uh, the, uh, the government of General Sisi. But when the U.S. demanded that Egypt uh, refuse Russia to have access to its airspace, General Sisi said no. Were well, the U.S. expecting that? No, the U.S. did not expect, uh, expect it from Egypt uh, to uh, reject a U.S. demand because the U.S. is not receiving a, a, a clear no only from Egypt. There are other countries in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, who are saying no to the U.S. This is why Egypt dares to say no, because today in the Middle East, they see the consequences of the war in Ukraine, the proxy war in Ukraine, is affecting the U.S. hegemony. Undoubtedly, the U.S. still have the strongest military power. However, its hegemony is no longer uh, dominating the world. There are countries in the Middle East who are striking a balance today between all the superpowers, all the countries of the region. They want to look after their interests first and not America first, as Europe unfortunately is still doing and not realizing and not realizing that they really need to wake up and create less gap between the population and the leadership. In the Middle East, they are managing to do so. Saudi Arabia rejected to increase the oil production. The Emirates did exactly the same. Egypt is saying no to the U.S. Uh, they are dealing today with their own cur currency, giving a hit to the dollar. So all these are the invisible consequences of the U.S. proxy war on Russia that we will still be collecting in the years ahead. And we haven't properly, people are not seeing the advantages all the countries of the region are getting by exchanging uh, trade with their own currency, by opening up on a new model that uh, countries like China and Russia, Brazil, South America, uh, Iran are asking them to use their own currency, using an alternative to the SWIFT. There is no dictating policy upon them. You have to do this. You, ha you don't have to do that. You have to abandon this country today. The, uh, the uh, Americans are putting pressure on Saudi Arabia and the Arab League to prevent the return of Syria with no benefit from, uh, for the Americans. So all these nonsensical decisions that come from the Americans today are very much understood by the countries in the Middle East 
However, today the only change is that these countries are raising their voice and saying, it doesn't suit us. I'm sorry, no. How ironic, Elijah, that the former colonies of the European powers in the uh, Middle East and across the Muslim world are finding their true independence just at the moment that the former colonists in the European countries are becoming the satrapies that their colonies used to be. Elijah Magnier, always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Let me take a quick break. Mr. President, we got a report of a 50-foot woman marauding through Washington, sir. Thank you, Captain. But I'm looking for a shorter woman, one who likes to take long strolls in the park and yell at minorities. She's not looking for a date. She's terrorizing the city. Is there a difference? (laughs) A little levity. Call in the military. We are the military, sir. Boy, we got here fast. We better do something, right? Shall I scramble the jets, Mr. President? No thanks, I'll just take a muffin and some coffee. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, it's not just our audience that is breaking new records, 1.6 million viewers in the last seven days. It's the number of people calling the show, oftentimes now in the hundreds, hundreds of people calling the show trying to get on the air. But another harbinger of that growth is the size of our polls. And this poll may very well be the biggest poll that we have ever had. It is this. Is Israel guilty of war crimes in Gaza? On Twitter, where 1,621 people have voted, it's A, yes, 85%, B, no, 15%. Now, on Twitter especially, the supporters of Israel have got a real operation. So that result is an indication of how public opinion is switching. On YouTube, it's yes, 93%, no, 7%. And 1,561 of you have voted on that. On Telegram, 857 people have voted. 96% say that Israel is guilty of war crimes in Gaza and only 4% say no. And on the YouTube community poll, now always the biggest, it is yes, 88%, no, 12%. You can still vote. You've got more than an hour in which you can still vote. Super chats are flooding in. Thank you very much indeed. Our good and loyal friend Roar Axdal sends 59 Norwegian crowns. A very, very big thank you. Ange2099 sends five pounds says, George, sorry, haven't contributed for a couple of weeks. Love and blessings to the Galloway Massive. Thanks, Ange. Beautiful. Craig Chambers sends five British pounds. Thank you, Craig. Boca Janduma, a good friend of ours in the Netherlands, sends another six euros and says, depleted uranium just regained its toxicity after Russia blew it up near Lviv. The, the explosion this week of the NATO munitions, many of them literally not even unpacked from their cases and costing billions of dollars and euros in uh, European and North American subvention was really something to behold. I've used the still of it in a uh, poster for this uh, show. I think we've got uh, some video of it if uh, the director uh, would like to show it at some stage. But the music, amongst the munitions that were blown up were the depleted uranium bombs sent to Ukraine by the British government. There is that explosion. That 
dear friend, is the inferno of billions of your taxpayers' dollars, euros, and pounds. Wow. Just think about that. As I'm on that subject, Britain's ancient hatred of Russia is now reaching the level of the highly dangerous to the interests of the British people. Little Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, so small a man that he didn't have the guts to face me in the debate at the Oxford Union for which he had committed and was advertised, said that before this is all over, Vladimir Putin is going to be begging him for mercy. He really isn't, Ben. Trust me on that. He really, really isn't. Doc Jazz, as always a great supporter, sends 50 AED from the United Arab Emirates. Thank you, George, for always supporting our Palestinian people. I'm sure you've also noticed that Israel initiating an attack on Gaza has relieved Netanyahu from months of protests against him. Indeed, everything has a number of motives. Uh, now, <laughs> guess what's coming your way on Sunday, if you speak German, although everybody can watch it. Motz auf Deutsch, our show in German, presented by a long-standing German parliamentarian, Dr. Dieter Dem is a man like me in many regards, in fact, spookily so, right down to the taste in jackets and hats. Together, Dr. Dieter and I have spent almost half a century in Parliament. He in the German Parliament, me in the British. We have a number of things in common. One of them is the love of a good argument and the love of freedom of speech with which to conduct that argument. Our show in German will be a beacon, a paragon of free speech. People with different views will not just be welcomed, they will be sought after. And that's a much healthier democratic approach to media. But one of the things in talking with Dr. Dieter that became obvious to me is that Actually, media is the new parliament. Media is the new battleground. You can do more in media than you can do as someone like me or someone like him can do in parliament. They are very talented people, our German team. As you'll see, take a look at this trailer. Sunday, Motes of Deutsch. Mozart Deutsch, die Mutter aller Talkshows. Ein Format, in dem Sie nicht verarscht werden, aber der Journalismus einen Arsch in der Hose hat. Was wollen wir trinken? Neben mir steht George Galloway, eine Legende des kritischen Geistes in Großbritannien. Jemand, der ewig lange im Parlament gesessen hat und viele Millionen Menschen erreicht mit Moz auf Englisch. Kritisch unabhängig informiert über das, was in großen Medien vertreten und verschwiegen We want to talk about our issues, argue them, debate them. We don't want a return to guns and rockets. Dancing on Hitler's grave. You know, Dr. Dieter and I have almost 50 years of parliamentary experience. Him in there and me in the British Parliament. We have learned that it's just as important to be taking the message out amongst the people. Ohne Meinungsfreiheit kann Demokratie nicht funktionieren. Und besonders die Leute, die weniger verdienen, müssen Meinungsfreiheit erkämpft bekommen. Dazu wollen wir beitragen. Mit Musik, mit Humor. Mit Satire. The media is the new battlefield. Media is the new parliament. So we haven't left politics. We're just practicing it in a modern way. Dann ist es die Frage, dass wir natürlich den Sozialstaat sanieren, dass wir den Mittelstand unbedingt retten müssen. Und dann ist es natürlich die Frage der Abrüstung 
und des Friedens. Mehr ist es nicht. Here I am at Checkpoint Charlie, the very border between the American sector and the Soviet sector. Little did we know that things would get much more dangerous and has now reached the stage where we are on the brink of a nuclear war in Europe. Modes auf Deutsch mit ihrer tätigen Hilfe. Sie können anrufen, sie können Fragen stellen. Wir werden prominente Gäste haben. Wir werden Fachleute haben, die wir fragen. Am 21. Mai, 17 Uhr und dann jeden Sonntag Modes auf Deutsch mit mir, Dieter Dehm. Abonniert die Kanäle. And don't forget to press the bell button for notification so that you never miss him and Modes auf Deutsch. Einfach mitmachen, Mut machen, anrufen. And I'll tell you what, it'll be explosive. Just you wait and see. Well, I don't know about you, but I absolutely loved that and really excited at the launch of our German show next Sunday at 5 p.m. Berlin time. So that's 4 p.m. UK time. You might want to watch it, even if your German is a little rusty, but if you're a German speaker, if that is your mother tongue, you'd be a fool to miss it because you definitely won't find anything like it on the mainstream German media. Nothing at all like it. If you think Britain is bad, Germany is now, in media terms, a complete dictatorship. You cannot say the things that I have been saying tonight and the things that our show in the German language will be saying over the uh, near future. So next Sunday, Moats of Deutsch. In fact, I think we'll try and get Dr. Dieter on Wednesday's Moats uh, to talk to him. His English is quite good, actually. An experienced intellectual, a singer, songwriter of very great note and success. And he is an author as well as a filmmaker. In fact, some of his books, I don't know, little edgy, risque. That was one of them I saw on his shelf the other day that I wouldn't put on my shelf. This man is a Renaissance man. He's a man of the arts. Some of his songs have been translated and sold in their millions uh, around the world. Pete Seeger, for example, uh, regularly used his work. Dr. Dieter was once the tour manager for the kinks on tour in Germany in the 1960s. Just think about that. Now he's on with me on Moats of Deutsch. Tom Orr has emailed the show. He says 1.6 million viewers, not too shabby. Tip of the iceberg, I think. Not interested in the sheep. Moats is waking the lions. That's more important. And who the hell is the 15% in this poll? Uh, who don't think Israel is guilty of war crimes. I wish they would call. Me too. 08 08 Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. US plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. Rest of the world four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Two thousand one hundred and eighty seven uh two thousand one hundred uh, no, 21,870 people have voted in the poll and it's rising by the second. Stu is on the line in West Wales on Ukraine. Stu, welcome to the show, my friend. Hi, George. Hi. Yeah, um, I wish you wasn't, but, you know, I read something this morning that really uh, upset me all day. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very um, clearly. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I get updates from the IAEA, IAEA website uh, about what's going on in Ukraine. And there was one from the Director General on the 12th of May, which is just gone. And what he has to say was really quite alarming to me, uh, that the war is heading to, uh, into the Zaporizhia, towards the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant closer and they can't get maintenance guys in there, and it's all going to shit over there, mate. And it's on a big scale. And like, while we're doing that, and we're wondering why they're aiming at that plant, I'm also knowing that NATO is going to do a war game pretty soon 
on an Article 5 scenario up and down the length of the NATO border. Now, mate... <laughs> Yeah, good luck to them. Uh, good, good, good. Uh, yeah, good, 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 good luck to them. I've, I've lost uh, patience. Uh, I've got to tell you, uh, Stu. Uh, it's not that I have a death wish, <laughs> even though I'm on the Ukrainian death list. Uh, but uh, I mean, frankly, if they want a war, they're going to get one, and they're going the right way about getting one. And maybe that is unavoidable. Maybe we are on a course which is simply uh, impossible to deflect. Certainly, I think that's the view in Moscow. I listen carefully to what the leadership of the Russian Federation say and what their military say. And I think they think that uh, NATO and Russia are going to have a war. How big a war, across which uh, theatres and what weaponry will be used, of course is something we uh, cannot anticipate. But the fact that the environmental movement, the green movement, is utterly silent on the Ukrainian offensive around the gates of the nuclear power plant in Zaporizhzhia. A nuclear power plant is under attack by a NATO armed, funded, and inspired army tells you everything you need to know about NATO, about the net zero hoax, about their utter carelessness about the environment, the people that released all that methane into the atmosphere by blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline, are now bombing the outskirts, the perimeters of a gigantic nuclear power plant, bringing to Europe a uh, new Chernobyl, Chernobyl plus, plus, plus. And the Greens have nothing to say about it. The so-called leftists have nothing to say about it. They want us to cycle to work to protect the environment. They want us to burn less fuel and shiver more in our houses to protect the environment. But they are silent about a military attack on a nuclear power plant by the countries that they belong to, and indeed in the case of Germany, are in the government of. You really couldn't make this up. Last call before the break it is Jamie. In Plymouth. Go ahead, Jamie. Good evening, Mr. Galloway. I hope you're well this evening. By the grace of God, I am. Thank you so much. Lovely to hear it. Yes, um, I've got a question. I think I've got a bit of an unusual standpoint on it. My background is half okay. Russian and I'm half British, including being born and have lived in Russia for some time. So with regards to this, okay. let's call it conflict at the moment. <laughs> although it is a war and invasion, mm -hmm. let's be honest. Uh, so naturally, I've heard both sides of the argument at quite a lot of length. Something I chat a lot about with my Russian counterparts, and even uh, a while back, even a couple of friends from Lugansk, it's with regards to Finland joining NATO, it appears that the big feeling in Russia among the citizens, not what you'd hear on the news and everything else, but just straight from the mouths of actual Russians, is that NATO sort of already won their intended victory by getting a country on the border with Russia to join NATO. In this case, naturally, it's Finland. So <laughs> I, in particular, have noticed that the UK's pro-Ukrainian propaganda has decreased massively since that announcement. Obviously, it's still a big thing in America, and, of course, Joe Biden's using it to, I assume, help try and win the next election, however that may go. But um, I suppose I'm asking, do you think that this was the point of the war, like, Finland's now joining, and America has had to do nothing to get them to do it. They've just used the threat of Ukraine, uh, Russian invasion to do it. Do you think they're sort of slowly going to give up on Ukraine or, and um, maybe strengthen arms elsewhere, or do you think they're going to create another false flag to maybe do something in Belarus or something along those lines? Uh, Finland is a crumb. Uh, that you can flick uh, off your table or a piece of fluff that you can brush off your 
shoulder. Uh, the Finnish people who turned up at the border to do their u- weekly, usual weekly bargain shopping at the weekend uh, were in for a rude surprise when they were refused entry to Russia. There'll be no more shopping sojourns by the good burgers of Finland in the wonderful shops of St. Petersburg anymore. Uh, Finland will be obliterated in the first 60 seconds of any conflict between Russia and NATO. It will literally disappear off the map, as will these yapping dogs in the Baltic republics, so-called. I saw Estonia's minister today warning China. <laughs> Not joking. Warning China that Estonia will stand up to them from a position of strength, unquote. A position of strength? There are housing estates in Shanghai with a bigger population and a bigger GDP than the entirety of the so-called Republic of Estonia. So these countries are nothing. Ukraine, of course, with its very big population and above all its vast territory, one of the biggest countries in Europe, and the actual invasion point from which Napoleon, Hitler, and many others have invaded Russia in the past was of a different order. So I don't believe that uh, NATO's recruitment of Finland is in any case of any significance. And of course, Finland was a Nazi collaborator in the Second World War, as was so-called neutral Sweden. So it's now dormant application to join the European Union, dormant thanks to the veto of President Erdogan, I didn't come as any surprise to me either. I see they won the Eurovision Song Contest. At least they didn't have to change the color scheme. IKEA won it either way. The Swedes were never neutral. The Swedes were always first Nazi collaborators and then throughout the Cold War, uh, covert, closet allies of NATO and the United States. So I'm afraid, Jamie, I don't agree with you. Neither do I agree that the West's support for Ukraine is waning. The public opinion of the West's support for Ukraine has sunk almost without trace. But the political leaders are as gung-ho for war as they have ever been. Now, after this short break, It's an African giant, the founder and CEO of African Stream, Ahmed Kabalo, to talk about everything from Sudan to South Africa. Africa is where it's all going to be happening in the years and decades to come. You need to get up to speed. Ahmed Kabalo on Africa coming up. The airwaves. This savanna is a rigid dictotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. 
Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Twenty two thousand five hundred and ninety six votes are in and they are literally climbing by the second on the question. Is Israel guilty of war crimes in Gaza? The answer is yes. Eighty five percent. Yes. Ninety three percent. Yes. Ninety six percent. Yes. Eighty eight percent. Get your vote in. I'm sure that Israel will be paying great attention to this show and to the results of this poll. But whether they are or they are not, they absolutely indicate the huge change that has been sweeping through Western English-speaking world public opinion over the last decades. You know, when I began my involvement in the Palestinian cause in 1975, you could have fitted all the supporters of the PLO in Britain into this room, I'm not joking, and had room for an elephant. Look at it now, overwhelming sympathy and support for the Palestinian people and a rejection of decades of false narrative fed to the public by the supporters of Israel. Uh, Ahmed Caballo uh, is a figure of great importance, a great footballer, a Manchester United supporter, a friend of mine for many years, now living in Africa and the CEO and founder of African Stream, an increasingly influential source of news, information and analysis about Africa. He hastens from Sudan, his father a leading figure in the Communist Party of Sudan. So we're going to start at the top of Africa, but I promise him we're going to end up at the bottom of it. Ahmed Caballo, welcome on board. The mother of all talk shows. Good to see you again. Uh, Manchester United have done better this season, but still a lot more to do. I know you'll be following from Africa every kick of uh, every ball. I do, and I'm even farther away than you are. Uh, from Old Trafford uh, right now. Let's start with the events in Sudan. Who's fighting whom, on whose behalf, and who's winning, who's losing? Okay, thank you for having me, George. And yeah, great to be on your show once again. Um, I've been listening and it's a fantastic show so far. So who's fighting who? So there is Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, a.k.a. Hemeti, who is the leader of the Rapid Support Forces fighting on one side, and there is General Abdel Fattah al burhan the leader of the armed forces, fighting on the other side. Now, you know, what they're fighting for is quite unclear at the moment because I can't see victory for either side. So it seems to be perpetual fighting, um, in my opinion, with the overall long-term goals of derailing the uh, move towards democracy, um, which now looks further far, further afield than it's ever looked. Um, now, who's backing who? That's a very interesting question. Um, so Egypt backs General Abdel, Abdel, Abdel Fattah al uh for several reasons. One of the reasons is because they don't want, they want to see an army in control, an army that they control, um, and they also don't want to see democracy in Sudan, which could trigger, you know, a move towards democracy in Egypt just across the border. But a bigger reason why Egypt backs Abdel Fattah al burhan is because of this perpetual tension that could lead to conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia um, over the Great Renaissance Dam. Now, um, Sudan historically has been in favour of the dam because the dam can help control, you know, the water uh, of the Nile. Uh, every year, the river Niles, banks flood and destroy the agriculture in Sudan. So actually, a dam would benefit us. But since uh, Bohan came into power, they've been siding with, with Egypt against Sudan's national interest. That's number one. 
Number two, um, since the TPLF was removed from power democratically, uh, the United States has been looking for a reliable ally in the region. Uh, and Bohan presents them as that reliable ally. Uh, Bohan is the one that pushed for normalization with Israel, which was a signal to the West that it was a change from the old guard, change from this kind of hostility that defined the Bashir years. And Bohan has actually been supporting the TPLF in the insurgency against Ethiopia and Eritrea. So that's, you know, that covers Egypt and uh, the US, but we have many more players. We have General Haftar from Libya, who supports the Rapid Support Forces, who, who the Rapid Support Forces was used in General Haftar's push for power in Libya. We have the UAE, who supports the Rapid Support Forces. Uh, General Hameti controls the biggest gold mines in um, in Sudan. Most of that gold ends up in the UAE. Both the UAE and the Persian Gulf states um, are very interested in the Port of Sudan region, which is a strategically very important region as it has access to the Suez Canal, the Gulf of Aden, the Horn of Africa, and the Middle East. And then, of course, we haven't even got into the discussion about the Russian naval base and the role that it plays in all of this. Um, now, obviously, none of this can be proved, but the U.S. Embassy came back to Sudan on the 22nd of April 2022. Um, and then the U.S. Embassy evacuated Sudan on the 23rd of April 2023. In the space of that year, we had the U.S. Ambassador warning uh, the military council, which consisted of Hameti and Bohan, against this Russian naval ba base, saying there will be dire consequences. And here we are, you know, less than a year later. Uh, uh, not to say it's them, but we've definitely seen dire consequences on the streets of Khartoum, Bahri and Unduman. It sounds like there are no winners, but it's obvious who are the losers. And the losers are the the poor people of Sudan with their yearning for uh, a proper democracy in their country. Their infrastructure, such as it was, is being destroyed. Their very lives are at stake if they walk out onto the street. Uh, what do you think public opinion can do in these circumstances where two armed bodies of men uh, are confronting each other uh, you might say two men, two bald men fighting over a comb. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one because usually in a conflict, you know, there's a side that you want to win. And in this situation, both sides are reactionary. Both sides have caused, you know, distress and terror to the people of Sudan for many years. The Sudanese army has been responsible for seven coups since independence. It was the military apparatus behind Bashir as he con con conducted his, you know, genocidal policy in Darfur and the Blue Nile region and the Uber Mountains. And then on the other hand, we have the Rapid Support Forces, which was which was the army fighting on the ground um, in Darfur, which has been in the last few years a kind of mercenary gun for hire group used in Central African Republic, Libya, Chad and Mali. So it's like, who do you want to win? And there was a recent audio recording from, um, you know, allegedly someone in the army saying that they should use the fighting to kill the leaders of the freedom forces and change. So the Sudanese people are really stuck between a rock and a hard place uh, because, you know, the military winning this conflict um, will only embolden them and make, you know, the democracy movement weakened. And the rapid support forces, which is a genocidal outfit winning this conflict, would be a disaster as well. So, you know, I was just given a speak, speech via Zoom um, in Burkina Faso, and they asked me the same question, what's the solution? And unfortunately, I don't have an answer. I guess the best thing that the Sudanese people can hope for is for both sides to run out of bullets and to, you know, come to the, come to the table and negotiate some sort of settlement. Uh, dismal uh, indeed. Uh, Ahmed, uh, I just read this afternoon about one of many, not just in Africa, but around the world, uh, these uh, Christian evangelical uh, crackpots uh, who, who 
gather a following uh, in their cult and then murder them. Uh, I'm reading now in Kenya, hundreds of people have been murdered by their cult leader and their organs harvested. And the name of the cult is Good News International Church. What can you tell us about them? Yeah, I mean, it's a really, really terrible story. Um, and I think, you know, the the problem behind the story is that in Africa, as the rest of the world, but felt more acutely in Africa, there's this huge economic crisis that has been exacerbated by this conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And this economic crisis has exacerbated these preachers who pray on the um on the neediness and the desperation of their people and and you know the, this idea that you can get closer to god if you do these ridiculous you know uh sacrifices or donations it's kind of like victorian britain where you know there'd be a preacher on the side of the street telling people telling the peasants to give all of their all their savings to get into heaven um and we're seeing more and more of these cases We've done a few reports about it on African Stream, and we've got more reports coming up. It's a really, really sad story. President William Ruto has described it as an act of terrorism, um, and I think that's probably an, a, an accurate description. Um, and yeah, it's it's just a real sad story uh, where a preacher has preyed on those that are desperate. But unfortunately, this isn't an isolated incident, and we're seeing more and more of these stories pop up, especially as the economic crisis exacerbate so for everyone's sake we need you know this conflict in ukraine to be over and for the economic crisis that has inflicted the whole world but particularly africa at the moment to to, to come to an end uh finally some good news uh although uh, the anc government in south africa has been a huge disappointment in many ways uh, perhaps increasingly so certainly for me i speak personally, I suppose, on that. Uh, they sure have stood up to the United States over the issue of uh, Russia, Ukraine, and uh, they left the American ambassador no alternative but a humiliating withdrawal and apology for the attack on the government he is uh, accredited to over the issue of weapons supplies. Bring us up to date, would you, on that? Yeah, I mean, the U.S. has accused South Africa of supplying Russians to uh, to Russia. Uh, South Africa denied it. However, they did set, said they would set up some sort of inquiry, which to me sounded strange. Why would you need to, you know, investigate something that is not true? Um, I'm not aware of the latest um, regarding the, you know, the 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 retraction by the South African government. So apologies for that. Maybe you can update me. Well, no, the, uh, the South Africans summoned the American ambassador. They gave him a uh, real blasting. And uh, subsequently, the American ambassador apologized to South Africa for clearly crossing the line uh, of mm. uh, undip undiplomatic uh, behavior. But I suppose my overarching point was the vast majority of people in South Africa know that it was Russia that was on their side fighting apartheid and America that was on the side of apartheid. Exactly. And we saw this with the proposed BRICS summit, which is going to happen in August in South Africa. You know, we saw Julius Malema, who's the leading opposition figure from a black party, saying that he would personally, you know, escort President Putin to the country. We saw President Ramaphosa saying that, you know, it's time to maybe leave the ICC. And that's because, you know, Africans' history or memory isn't as short as the West would like us to think it is. We remember who supported apartheid. We remember who opposed apartheid. And, and you know, if, if South Africa wants to do drills with China and Russia, that is their right. If it wants to orbit towards, um, you know, that to the, to, towards China and Russia, that is their right. And we're seeing that actually this policy by the United States of weaponizing their currency, weaponizing their dollar, is actually having an adverse effect and pushing more and more countries 
um, towards Russia and China. We saw it recently as Kamala Harris visited Africa. She was humiliated in Zambia. She was then humiliated in Gambia. She visited Tanzania and had a good photo with the newly elected female president. But still, overall, it was seen as a disaster for the United States. And that's because they're insisting that we, we take a part in a conflict. However, any other international issue of the day, they don't want to hear our voice. We Africans never got asked for our position vis-a-vis -vis Israel, Palestine. But now that we're, at, we're asked to take a position vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, Russia. Africa was never, the UN General Assembly was never seen as an important vehicle when every year they unanimously vote against the blockade against Cuba. But now the UN General Assembly is this important vehicle that we all need to utilize. So it's just hypocrisy at its finest and Africans can see it. And that's why, you know, state by state, they see their path towards prosperity um, closer aligned to China in particular than the United States. The debts that that, that China um, incurs on, on Africa doesn't come with conditions on how to spend your money on, on, on austerity, on IMF structural readjustment programs. So, you know, it's it's an obvious choice and it's obvious why all these all these African nations are moving in that direction. Finally, Ahmed, how do people follow your work? How can people support it? Well, for once, I'm going to say not to follow me, Ahmed Cabello, follow African Stream. All of the good work, all of the good work that I'm putting in is, you know, coming out via African Stream. So follow African Stream on TikTok, where we've now got 290,000 followers. Follow us on Instagram, where we've now got over 80,000 followers and growing. And we only launched at the end of September. So we've got a fantastic, young, dynamic team. We're all based, well, the core of the team is based in Nairobi. We've got freelancers in Nigeria, a freelancer in Haiti, a freelancer in Burkina Faso, and we're continuing to expand. And finally, if you're a pan-African anti-imperialist journalist, please contact us as we're looking to expand the team every single day. Fantastic. Ahmed Caballo, great to see you having gone so far. Thanks for joining us. Is Israel guilty of war crimes in Gaza? <laughs> uh, it is a record uh, poll. We have never had this many people voting before, and that in itself tells you something. Here are the numbers. It's your show now. 0808196552. If you're in the US and Canada, plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the rest of the world, four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Give me a drink to finish my tea. A big thanks to the people who support me on the Patreon page. I really have come to depend on the income from that. It costs a pound a week, not even the price of a cup of coffee in an insalubrious cafe. If you think you could stretch to that, please support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. Now the Moats team have added a tiered system on my Patreon page where you can become an official Moats graduate. How about that? I speak as someone who graduated from nowhere, uh, from the factory floor in Michelin. But you can become a Moats graduate and legend. Uh, you can give a regular donation to support the show and my work. You can now upgrade from a, a mere Patreon to a Moats graduate at £10 a month, as opposed to £5 a month, I think it is. Uh, and you can receive official Moats legend status for £20. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. A very big thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon. I really do uh, depend on that. Andy on Patreon says, regarding the viewership of Moats, your 1.6 million views in the last week, I know for an absolute fact that 10 to 20 people are watching you tonight in a small village in western Uganda using an old cell phone with a little screen. It's Mother's Day there, so happy Mother's Day, Mum.
I'll be saying more about Mother's Day, Andy, but thank you so much for that. I, I can't tell you how touched I am to hear that. Morris McIntyre says Israel has ignored all attempts to reconcile from the Oslo Agreement and to the many attempts over decades with Yasser Arafat, who really was the best hope. Full on boycotting and lobbying in peaceful protests has to be considered the only option is a two-state solution. Thank you, Morris. Matthew White says, yes, they are guilty of war crimes. Moreover, Israel and its US colonial sponsor render the United Nations entirely null and void. Thanks, Matthew. Graham Briggs White says, I cannot, he's a legend, Graham, by the way. He's a Moats legend, Graham Briggs White. I cannot comprehend, after all these decades, the constant displacement and theft of land that this is still allowed to go on. Yasser Arafat sadly died without seeing his people safe, and it disgusts me. Uh, Graham uh, will talk about President Arafat uh, one day. He is very sorely missed, not least by me. Hawk Lee, a new patron, thank you, Hawk, says, as backers of the Israeli apartheid regime, the US and UK and Australia are guilty of war crimes against the Palestinian people. So please do search out my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway and follow me. Calls right up till 10 o'clock. Saith in South Africa is the first of those. Saith, welcome to the show. Good evening, Mr. Galloway. Uh, so happy and privileged to be able to connect a first time listener. Call Thank I you mean, so first -time much, caller. Mm. Yeah, ahead, um, so, so um, I'm calling uh, just to comment on the debacle concerning the U.S. ambassador's remarks, uh, the allegations about South Africa supplying Russia with arms, and just to provide some context to perhaps some of your, your viewers and listeners who uh, need a bit of context. So in December last year, a Russian cargo ship, the Lady R, docked in Simonstown, which is um, which happens to be South Africa's uh, South African Navy's largest base. Uh, there were media reports that some cargo was loaded onto the ship, the the contents of which remain a matter of speculation. And when pressed about the matter, the defense minister dismissed the allegations about um, arms transfer and. Um, Interestingly, following this incident uh, earlier this year, we then saw South Africa conduct joint naval exercises with Russia and China in February, uh, around the same time as the one-year anniversary of the Russia-Ukraine war. When we take together um, this development, it comes as a little surprise that uh, this development riled the United States. Um, coupled, of course, with South Africa's stance of non-alignment with regard to the Russia-Ukraine war. What's, what's interesting uh, is that the timing of the American ambassador's comments also come at a time when South Africa is preparing to host the BRIC summit, uh, a momentous period in history when we are witnessing the makings of the multipolar world order, something which uh, the U.S. and its allies, of course, find antithetical to the U.S.-led hegemonic liberal order. So on the foreign policy side of things, uh, Mr. Galloway, I think it's important to mention that on the line uh, is South Africa's eligibility um, under the African Growth Opportunity Act, uh, AGOA, uh, which is up for, for renegotiation in 2025. Um, AGOA grants uh, duty-free access to thousands of South African exports. And also inadvertently, perhaps, South Africa finds itself caught up in a geopolitical context so its foreign policy metal is being uh, tasted, tested, and uh, the capacity to balance values and interest in an increasingly fragmented um, world order. And I think it's also important to mention that this, of course, tells us or points us to the classic two-level game in foreign policy, this balancing of domestic and external interest in light of the juncture which South Africa finds itself in, uh, an embattled economy, um, energy crisis uh, to the extent that which the state is actually struggling to keep the, the lights on. And it, it can scarcely afford to be embroiled in a costly ge uh, geopolitical and zero-sum 
um, um, diplomatic crew. And, and just in the bigger scheme of things, it's, um, it's, a, it's an important crucible for South Africa's post-apartheid foreign policy and for the Ramaphosa administration. And um, it also um, leads us to, to just contend with the, the idea that South Africa is being forced to grapple, grapple with um, a bigger question about national interest and the means and trade-offs that come with pursuing the national interest. Well, thank you, ma'am. A very powerful uh, statement. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll only add this context that Africa, uh, South Africa, has always been in the maelstrom of geopolitical uh, complication. It's just that its stance has uh, changed uh, when uh, apartheid South Africa was a tool of NATO and Western uh, geopolitics. And now that apartheid is overthrown, that South Africa is liberated, uh, then it's only right that South Africa's role in this complicated geopolitical world is a very different one. And this, finally, if South Africa did supply weapons to Russia, what is wrong with that? Every country in the European Union is supplying weapons to Ukraine. Why are supplying weapons to Ukraine kosher, but supplying weapons to Russia are haram? Where does that idea come from? There are no United Nations sanctions on Russia, because of course no such resolution could ever get through the United Nations. These are Western sanctions. Well, let Western countries sanction as they will, even though increasingly they're discovering, in truth, they're sanctioning themselves, but let them. It's their right to sanction anybody that they please, but they cannot order other people to join their unilateral, extraterritorial sanctions. This is a very important point. Ma'am, thank you for the call. Uh, Deke is in London, but also wants to talk about Africa. Deke, welcome to the show. Hello, George. Sir, go ahead. Hello, George. How are you? All good. Thank you very much. What would you like to say, sir? And I just wanted to say, obviously, the biggest issue Africa have is the westernized involvement within in the countries all over Africa. And there's uh, rumors going on in African radio. They'll probably be kicking out all the NATO embassy out of Africa within the next two years. Do you think that's possible? I don't, and I wouldn't advise it. Uh, I don't think uh, kicking out embassies is in general... A good idea. It's always wise to have a channel uh, through which you can speak. I'm in favor of jaw jaw rather than war war, and so I always deplore it when embassies are closed. Go on, Dick. Um, and I'm biggest fan you have. Obviously, I've been following you for years, and obviously I stand Thank by you. you every word you said and. The things you stand up for as a man is, 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 is touching the heart of all men so who has a good heart. And I always appreciate you. Thank and you, I, I'm a big follower in Twitter, obviously. And I'm the, always the guy to say, MashaAllah, and your kids. But I'm glad I spoke to you for thank once you. in my life. And I'm so happy to hear your voice through my phone for once. But I thank you, sir. The, pl the pleasure is entirely mine. And may God bless you and yours. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, Josh is in London on Ukraine. Let's hear about that. Josh, what would you like to say, sir? Well, I was, I was just wondering, George, because of all the you know contradictory information about how Ukraine has rested about, has advanced something like two kilometers in six months around Bakhmut, while the Russians have continued to take various sub suburbs of additional suburbs of Bakhmut. I, I mean, all this, you know, sort of ambiguity, this uh, confliction, all this, um, you know, disconcerting uh, 
all these disconcerting sources. I just want to, I don't know what to believe, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't trust, I don't particularly trust, you know, sources from Moscow any more than I trust sources from Washington or London. But I just wondered if you could clear up the uh, sort of the cacophony, if you like, of, of uh, contradiction and uh, confliction regarding the, the latest updates on this uh, battle. Yeah. Well, I get my uh, information from uh, Telegram channels uh, that are uh, close to the action, that have sources close to the conflict on, on both sides. Uh, in passing, I mentioned that in an era where media has never been better resourced and tooled, and where there were, there's more journalists and broadcasters in the world than there has ever been, how come there is no coverage from the battlefield, from the front line? was more coverage on television of the Vietnam War when you used to have to fly the film reels all the way back to the United States. So it's passing strange that there is so little reliable information. And the Telegram channels that I follow, I don't treat any of them as gospel. You're quite right to uh, say, as you just did, you uh, do not automatically believe something because it comes from Moscow any more than you would automatically believe it because it came from London or New York. And I'm in the same boat. Uh, all I can tell you is what I think has happened is that in Bakhmut, uh, the Russians control uh, approximately 95% of the city and its surrounding suburbs and factories and industrial areas and the Ukrainian armed forces control roughly 5% and I think that the intention of the UAF of Kiev is to withdraw the 5% while they still can. Uh, the Russians have I think deliberately left a road uh, free uh, out of which that 5% occupied by U the UAF could be evacuated. I don't want to see anybody more uh, slaughtered than they already have been. I want to preserve life uh, in the Ukraine, uh, unlike the leaders of NATO who are determined upon death. Richard is in Manchester, a good friend of the show on Iraq. Go ahead, Richard. Hi, George. Thank you ever so much indeed for taking my call. It's always a great pleasure. I watch you as much as I can and every, certainly every Sunday. And it's very, very informative. It's a, it's a show that really, really spells it out and tells the bloody truth to everybody, which we don't get anymore. I'm pretty sure of that. But thank, thank you, you once again for taking my call. Um, when I've met you, George, <clears throat> we've discussed things um, uh, about uh, people like uh, Jeff Hoon, um, and I think you mentioned him earlier in, in your monologue, um, and he yeah. just brought out a new book called See How They Run, um, and he says in the book, and I, I really am quoting from what I've researched today, that uh, Jonathan uh, Powell uh, told an aide to burn all the legal documents containing pr proof that Blair was a liar and he had obtained permission. Uh, he did not obtain uh, permission uh, to go to war. Um, and then the following night in the last week, you're probably very much in front of me on this, that it, it, I think he now thinks because he's got all this money and he's now washed his soul through it, um, he's going to come back and being messianic uh, as he has always been uh, to take over the new labor again uh, and i th i think that he thinks that uh, all the allegations about war crimes and so on that he's got over but now we hear that as a possibility that uh, people uh, can retrospectively be taken to the hague and uh, and uh, punished, or at least interviewed, uh, about war crimes, uh, George. And I wondered, I remember at one of your shows, uh, I muted this to you, and uh, I think it was felt uh, by the audience that uh, 
uh, it's not something uh, that will ever happen. But I was delighted to hear this noise, whatever it was, that the possibility that it, it could happen. I wonder what you feel about that. No, uh, the Iraq war uh, predates the establishment of the International Criminal Court. Uh, the main participant in the Iraq war uh, crime, the United States, is not a signatory to the ICC. Uh, and the ICC has no uh, jurisdiction over the Iraq war. Uh, the truth is, these courts are a confection. They are lipstick on the pig of the utterly lawless, nihilistic, anarchistic uh, international order as was. It's now an order that is coming to an end. They called it the rules based international order, which they invented in the Chicago Doctrine enunciated by Tony Blair in Chicago in 1998, which was the uh, theoretical basis of the NATO assault on Yugoslavia, the dismemberment of Yugoslavia, then the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, and then Iraq, and then Libya and then Syria and so on. This Chicago Doctrine era of Blair and Clinton has very definitely come to an end. The uh, new emerging superpowers in the world, both military and economic, in some cases both, have declared time on their international order and the ICC is all washed up. Although, if it decides to do anything good, they mustn't forget that the United States government is in possession of an act of Congress called the Invasion of the Hague Act, which permits American armed forces to literally invade the Netherlands, invade the Hague, take prisoner the judges at the ICC in the Hague, and free any American defendant that had been arraigned in front of it. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Hose ABT sends 10 pounds. Old fan of yourself, Mr. Galloway, new fan of moats. Keep up the great work. The world needs people like yourself. Thank you so much. And for the donation, Nasri Akil, long-standing supporter of the show, uh, 20 Canadian dollars. God bless you and your family, GG. Keep punching. Thank you, Nasri. Torlo Burke, another great supporter of the show, sends five euros 99. See all the currencies? What have we had so far? Norwegian crowns, AED from the United uh, Arab Emirates, dinars. We've had uh, dollars, pounds, uh, Canadian dollars, Hong Kong dollars. It's really amazing. Thank you so much. Torlo Burke, five euros 99. Great show, George. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Thank you. Uh, Kamal Tanis sends Canadian dollars, 13.99. Vladimir Lukic, 10 euros. Gba Jumo, 20 Canadian dollars. Salutation, here's 20 Canadian, the cost of a cup of coffee and some in a typical insalubrious cafe here in Canada. All thanks to the skyrocketing inflationary pressures. Thank you. Uh, Opal Cat sends New Zealand dollars, eight ninety nine. Many thanks for all the information you share. George and co, free Assange. And Diogenes49 sends US dollars, nine ninety nine. The US is accusing other countries of war crimes. It's like the UN say, insisting on speeding tickets at a sanctioned auto race event. And nobody sends US dollars, seven Point seven seven. Thank you. Man must change or die. There is no other course. The world teacher, a.k.a. Christ, Maitra, Buddha, Imam, Mahdi, Krishna, etc. Reference, Benjamin Krem. Thank you for that. Back to the lines. Michael is in Washington on Biden-Trump. Go ahead, Michael. Guten Tag, Herr Galloway. Well, isn't it exciting, the German show coming up? Yes, it is, and I hope it spreads like fire. 
I have a feeling have, it will, you know. We, I've, I have noticed uh, through my studies and observations of politics about the world, many thanks to you, that leadership positions seems to be um, getting a little bit worse. It's almost as if it's a center of gravity for sociopaths who, who like to lie. And the reason uh, you got you got people, most people, they like to get a job, have a family, go to work. But in the leadership positions, I've noticed there's two types. There's builders and destroyers, it seems like. Donald Trump, he's a builder. He makes a situation win-win. But creatures like uh, this Biden fellow, it's win-lose. He destroys other stuff and he says, oh, that's our win. Is that typical of politics that you've noticed? No, I'll tell you what the main change uh, for me, Michael, is the quality of the sociopaths. Uh, don't forget that I entered Parliament when Margaret Thatcher was uh, the wrecking ball, uh, applying herself to the British economy, to the manufacturing sector, to our industrial base, to our extricative uh, industries and so on. She was a very considerable sociopath, but she was of quality. She was good at it. She was plausible at explaining it. She was capable and competent. And around the world, you could say, uh, and I made the comparisons last week with De Gaulle and Macron, uh, with uh, with Willy Brandt and uh, Gerhard Schroeder and the Schultz, little soldier Schultz that we have now. I made these comparisons and I suppose my general thesis, Michael, is not that they are now sociopaths but before were St. Francis of Assisi, they never were. But the level of competence, capability, has shrunk to a dwarfish proportion uh, that is very difficult for me to believe. I spent nearly 30 years sitting uh, in the British Parliament and I kind of worked in and around the Parliament uh, for a good few years before that, uh, for seven years before that. So in that 37 years in which the British Parliament was my main theatre, if you like, in my life, I am astounded at the quality of the people that we now have in charge of British politics and of American politics. I mean, I'm looking at these videos of Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, and I honestly don't know whether to laugh or cry. I'm laughing at her because she's berserk. I mean, she truly is stark raving bonkers. Imagine her with the nuclear football at the bottom of her bed, and I look at her boss, Joe Biden, and I cannot get the image out of my mind that he'll fall over it in a rush to the bathroom, as is his wont, increasingly, kick the nuclear football and plummet us all into the destruction of the entire planet. Thank you, Michael. In Washington State, let's go to Mick in Notting Hill Mounds. My old stamping ground, Mick. Nice to hear from you. What would you like to say? We're going to Gabriel in New Mexico. We're going to come back to Mick in Notting Hill after that great build-up. Gabriel, welcome. George, I'm so delighted. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking to you from the edge of a rushing stream on the Picaris Pueblo in sight of a buffalo herd. Oh, um, is there a buffalo and, herd still extant? Yeah, and, and I'm on the edge of a Pueblo, you know, traditional, uh, not a reservation, but a continuously sovereign uh, uh, in, uh, Native I've American reading, territory of uh, Pickering's uh, tribe. I've been, I've been reading all about the destruction, the literal annihilation, the genocide of the Comanche people. Uh, whose demise was actually executed by my fellow countryman, a Scotsman, Ranald Mackenzie, 
next time you hear a Scotsman telling you that they are the victims of colonialism, just tell them about Ronald Mackenzie. Go ahead, Gabe. So uh, I, I, I've, all, I've been, uh, I've respected and, uh, and uh, admired you ever since uh, um, just short of 20 years ago, your uh, defiant exchange with Senator Coleman. Um, ah, yes. You know, the first Iraq good day. War. A good day, a great day. And I'm calling because, uh, you know, my grandfather flew for the Free French. He's buried in Fakenham outside of London, I think. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. my father wrote extensively on, on the uh, collabor French collaboration. And I think they would be rolling in the, in my, well, one is, one is alive that, that has dementia, but my grandfather would be rolling in his grave uh, at the, the historical amnesia and perversion of um, the way history has been erased. And um, I look, I, I remember, I, I, you probably remember this, but about a year ago, uh, the, the, the commemoration of uh, uh, Russian Victory Day above Times Square was amended to read Russian Shame Day. And uh, I'm no longer in New York City. If I had been, I would have, I would have got, I would have climbed up there and committed an act of vandalism. But um, well, Gabriel, it's it, not even just amnesia, is it? it? It's worse than amnesia. Amnesia, amongst forgetful people, can be understood. It is willful, deliberate. Orwellian, mendacious, lying, rewriting of history. It is stating falsehoods and presenting them as truths and erasing truths and turning them into falsehoods. I give you, given the hour, just one example. In 1950, 86% of French people, when asked, which country had made the greatest contribution to the victory in the Second World War answered the Soviet Union. Today, the majority of people in France believe that the United States made the greatest contribution to the victory in the Second World War, when Hollywood notwithstanding, nothing, to be honest, could possibly be further from the truth. Thanks, Gabriel. Mick in Notting Hill is back. Quick call from him. Mick, go ahead, sir. My goodness, I'm having trouble with Mick in Notting Hill. Can I go on to, El can I go to Eliana in Alaska? Who wouldn't want to go to Alaska? Eliana, welcome. Well, we're having trouble uh, with this. Is Israel guilty of war crimes in Gaza? 24,000 people have voted. Poll has just closed. It is on Twitter. Israel is guilty, 85%. On YouTube, guilty, 93%. On Telegram, guilty on 96%. And on the YouTube community poll, guilty, 88%. Eliana in Alaska is on the line. Eliana, welcome. Hi, George. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, I, I listen to your show and I am so, I, I am so thankful for you voicing the truth always. You know, you are a person Thank that you're you always being true uh, from a young age. Um, no yeah. masks. I have Thank a you. question. Are we are we jungle or are we um, a garden here in the United States? Borrell didn't mention the United States, I, I, but you know, like I see more, um, um, but I don't see a garden here. Well, I think that is beautifully expressed. Alaska may be a garden. I've never been there, but the great majority of American cityscapes, townscapes, uh, are uh, and its infrastructure, its bridges and its highways and so on are in such a parlous case uh, that uh, they would be far more 
uh, properly described as a jungle rather than a garden. For those who don't know, Joseph Borro, a Spaniard, uh, regards the European Union as a garden and described those outside the European Union as living in a jungle. He obviously hadn't looked round the capital cities and big cities uh, of the European Union's countries before making this deeply insulting comparison. But the truth is, all the growth and the development uh, of uh, prosperity and stability is outside of the European Union and North America. When I look at some of these pictures from San Francisco, from Chicago, when I look at the crime uh, statistics, as I do every weekend, about how many people were shot, how many people were murdered in the United States across uh, the uh, great urban landscapes, I'm all the while reminded that the United States is an empire in very steep decline. It's societal, it's cultural, it's soft power, uh, and it's economic power are all in rapid, steep decline. The only thing remaining, you might say this is a feature of jungle life, uh, is its big sharp teeth. And with its big sharp teeth, it can still inflict uh, horrific wounds on people, it can still tear them down, it can still destroy, but it has now no capacity to make, to build, as a caller just uh, mentioned there. Norma, the legend, is in Bristol, wants to have a word. Norma, always wonderful to hear your voice. What would you like to say? Hello, George. Um, I just made a few comments, actually. Um, I'll be yeah. quick because I know it's late. Um, the Ahmed Caballo man, I thought, was very knowledgeable. Now, um, it was a bit too complicated for me, the Sudan situation. But, I mean, the main point is no winners, and it's very, very sad for the ordinary people. <laughs> and the yeah. Christian evangelist in Kenya, that was depressing and sad. But the, the, I'll, I'll get to the point in a minute. But the African bias against the USA, now that was interesting. My point being, George, internationalism reigns supreme on your show. And thanks for having that guest and for educating us a bit more. It really is quite exciting at times, but a little bit complicated. Well, how lovely of you to say. We have uh, always tried, we set out to become uh, the global university of the airwaves. And I think we truly have, as is evident in every message, every call, every guest, every topic uh, that we turn to. Uh, we are the only people playing this role. One day there will be many, and we will be merely the pioneers uh, of this development. Kenny is in Acton, another legend. Kenny, what would you like to say, my friend? Hello, George. I just phoned up to sing a song, Hi, actually. I've been evening. jamming with a few guys who I met at a club a few weeks okay. ago. And we've been uh, okay. getting a song together, and they're ready to introduce themselves when you're ready. We'd need we'd maybe like about 90 seconds if, if you've got the time. I okay. do, I do, go just, ahead. Just let me know when you're ready and we'll get started, okay? I'm ready, I'm yeah. ready. You're I'm ready? all ears. Okay. Right, guys, guys, let's go. We start with Denny Wilson on the drum. Followed by Al Jardine on rhythm guitar. <laughs> Helped out by Carl, lead guitar, Wilson. And filled out instrumentally by our leader, Brian Wilson, on the bass. When we're ready to sing, we step up the microphone, and it comes out something like this. Well, I am pregnant. 
I can run, so don't bring me down. But I've got the fastest set of wheels in town. When something comes up to me, he don't even try. Cause if I had a set of wings, I know she can fly. She's my little bean scoop. You don't know what I got. Well, uh, glory to the beach boys. Glory to the Beach Boys of Acton, as unbeach-like a place as you can possibly imagine. Well, Kenny, thanks uh, for that. Unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time. It is Mother's Day, uh, or Birthing Parents' Day, as some would uh, have us uh, describe it now. Birthing Parents' Day, uh, the birthing parent that does the chest feeding, uh, to be more precise. But it'll always be Mother's Day to me. Uh, it is glorious that uh, my own mother is still alive, aged 88, and I send her uh, Mother's Day greetings. I greet my mother-in-law uh, in Indonesia uh, with the deepest respect, and I bow uh, before you. I greet all the mothers of the world on this International Mother's Day. Paradise lies under the mother's feet. This I truly believe. Of course, fathers are important, but it is the mother who nurtures and carries for nine long months uh, the uh, infant within and will almost certainly, in the overwhelming number of cases, uh, be the main caregiver, the main nourishment of that child in its early years. The mother could scarcely be more important and is thus exalted in the great religious texts. Incidentally, uh, Our Lady uh, Maria the Madonna is mentioned more often in the Quran than she is in the Bible. But the uh, exaltation of motherhood for millennia has not been for nothing because without our mothers we're not just nothing we literally would not have existed and we would not have become the men and women that we have become and one of the most repellent of many repellent current trends in social and cultural development in our country and in many countries around the Western world is to cancel the mother, to rename her, to pretend that a man can be your mother, to denigrate the sacredness of motherhood and of women. A woman is an adult female. A mother is an adult female who has given birth. Hallelujah. May God bless all the mothers of the world and damn all these efforts to cancel and degrade her. It's been marvelous for me. I hope it was for you. 1.6 million people watched last week. How many will watch this week? Let's see. Please spread the word about the show. Because if you all did, that would mean that one day I could announce that 3 million people had watched all or part of the Mother of All talk shows. Please bring at least one other viewer to the show. See you Wednesday at the later time of 9pm UK.